Broadcasting Company presents the first in a new series of famous stories for young people, Adventure Ahead. This week, a tale suggested by that epic of the sea, Two Years Before the Mast, by Richard Henry Dana, a story which has brought reading excitement to six generations of American boys and girls. And so, Adventure Ahead! It was 1844, and the first time that I ever saw the Pilgrim, I knew she was the ship for me. Because in all of Boston Harbor, she had the finest lines, the deepest draft, and masts that almost scraped the sky. Yes, the Clipper Pilgrim seemed the answer to my dream. The largest, tallest, most seaworthy ship that I had ever seen. And even though I'd never been to sea and hardly knew my way around a deck, I climbed aboard to find the captain. You looking for somebody? Well, uh, yes, I am. I want to speak to the captain. Not after a job, are you? A berth? Yes, sir. He's a fine ship. Maybe. There's worse ships afloat in the Pilgrim, and there's better ones, too. What do you mean? You'll find out soon enough, Captain Taylor, St. John. Do you think you'll take me? I've I never been to sea. It won't make much difference this trip. Pilgrim's due to sail tonight, and we need men. You look strong enough, husky. You can learn. We'll make a sailor out of you. Why, you might be first mate by the time we sail back home again. Well, thank you, Mr. Uh, my name's Harris. Save a mister for the office. I'm just one of the crew. All right, Harris. You'll find Captain Taylor aft. Aft? Need men to fill out the crew. I expect he'll be glad to see you. So, you want to sail before the mast, eh, lad? Yes, Captain. Yeah, you're kind of young. Any experience? I want to learn, sir. I'm not afraid to work. Yeah, you seem mighty anxious to sign aboard. Yes, sir, I am. Know where we're bound for? Well, uh, uh, no, sir. California, that's where. Know what that means? It's a long ways off, sir. Why, it may be a year or two years before we sail into Boston Harbor again. Makes no difference, Captain. I want to go to sea. Mm. I like the cut of your jib, lad. Thank you, Captain Taylor. You'll be kind of an apprentice seaman to start out, what we call a soldier. But the crew will show you the rope. Won't take you long to get the drift of sailing. No, sir. Keep your eyes and ears open, Dana, and obey the orders of the mate. The mate, sir? Yeah. First mate, Mr. Raggett. Yes, sir. Take your gear and go along now. Report to Mr. Raggett. You're the new man, eh? Yes, Mr. Raggett. Ever been a sea, Dana? No, sir. Ah, a landlubber. Please, sir, I want to be a sailor. All I'll right, try to work... Dana, none of your jaw. When I talk, lend an ear, understand? Yes, sir. Starting off as bad as the rest of the crew. How does the captain expect me to run this ship with a bunch of shoe clerks, cherry pickers, landlubbers? McCabe! Mr. McCabe! Hi, sir. Hi, Mick. Here's a new man, McCabe. Give him a bunk in the postal. Hi, Mick. Dana here thinks he wants to be a sailor. Yes, sir. But I'll take that out of him by the time we're on the horn. Hey, we all love her. that way, Mick. Oh, did we, Mr. McCabe? Hey. And who asked for your opinion? Well, I only... Don't forget, you're just the second mate on this ship, McCabe. When I want your opinion, I'll ask. But I only want... Shut up. I don't like a man that talks a lot, McCabe. I'll make you wish you never sailed aboard the Pilgrim. <laughs> Dana, your gear all stowed away? Oh, hello, Harris. Yeah, I'm all ready. You think we'll sail soon? Sometime tonight, the wind comes up. Oh. Say, you better get some sleep, Dana. After we get underway, you'll be busy climbing around the rigging most of the night. I'm too excited to sleep. <laughs> After a few months, you'll be glad to take your sleep when you can get it. Especially aboard this ship. What do you mean, Harris? When you've been around... Oh, hey, well, Dana, this is it. You mean we're underway? Hi, get a move on. Here's where you land to spread canvas. The sails were loose, the yards were great, and the Clipper Pilgrim was on her way, leaning from the damp night breeze and rolling with a heavy ground swell. Oh, everything seemed beautiful that night as we sailed into the dark Atlantic bound southward for Cape Horn and California. But in the morning, things didn't seem so beautiful. With all the crew on deck, the day started off with a few words from the captain, 
and Mr. Agate. Welcome to the Clipper Men. Some of you are old hands. You know the work I want. And the new men will manage fine if you obey the officers. That's me, the first mate, Mr. Agate, and second mate, Mr. McCabe. All right, take over, Mr. Agate. All right, stow the gas. You didn't sign aboard the Pilgrim for no pleasure cruise. I expect every man jack of you to work. And after that, work harder. Obey orders, do your duty. Farewell enough. But if you don't, I'll break the man that crosses me. Understand? All right. Stop and watch on deck. Rest of you below. <laughs> From that day on, our work seemed never to cease, for there was always work to do aboard a sailing ship, rigging to be examined, continually replaced, sails to be mended, and ropes or yards repaired, taking off, mending, putting on, taking off, mending, putting on. There's no rest for those at sea, regardless of the weather. It was difficult to learn at first, the scheme of things aboard a full-rigged clipper, but the crew helped me in every way. I never will forget Tom Harris's advice to me before I went aloft among the sails. First time. It's not hard, Dana. Keep one hand for yourself, one for the ship, and never spit the wind. The wind blew up and down the pilgrim's deck. Days grew into weeks and months. But there was always work to do. More work and still more work. Our Mr. Raggett thought of that. Washing down the deck, rubbing, holy stone, boiling up the rigging, racing up, mending sails. The ship was like a lady's watch, never in repair. One afternoon, when the weather was bright and we stood well off the coast of Brazil with a strong wind at our stern, move along, trim the top rope, bring in your boom. You, Dana Harris, I said, quite right along, coil up this rigging. I said, look aloft there. I want to see you slug at work, at work from ten to time. What are we to do? Bring in your boom. Well, Dana. Look Three months of this. What do you think of sea life now? Well, it's quite enough work, Harris, but I don't mind. I, uh, I'll get used to it, I suppose. No, Dana. As long as Mr. Raggett's aboard, none of the crew will get used to this driving, driving. Well, you shipped with him before, haven't you? Aye, many times. Hard work and never a kind word. Well, what about the captain? He's hardly ever up on deck. Doesn't he know the mate's just stirring trouble? I doubt it. Captain Taylor trusts the mate, I'm sure of that. And... Since the captain's sick so much, well, someone has to take command. The captain's sick in his cabin most of the time. What's wrong with Captain Taylor? I don't know. No one knows, I guess, except Dr. Agate. Dr. Agate? I... Does he know about medicine? I suppose his cabin's full of jars and bottles. Well, does that make him a medical man? Well, he's the maid. He keeps the medicine chest. Well, I hope then is I never get sick on this voyage. Well, none of Agate's cures or remedies for me either. All I need to keep me ship shape is my good luck charm. <laughs> as long as I have this, I'm safe. Can I see it? Hi. The lucky elephant. Yeah. Oh, an, an ivory elephant. Where'd you get it, Harris? India, four years ago. Oh, I'll uh, give it to you, Dana, someday uh, when I quit the sea. I'd like to have it, but that'll be a long time waiting. Wind's up, Dana. Aye, squally off the starboard. Dirty weather on the way, all right. Getting near Cape Horn. It uh, won't be many days. Oh, here's McCabe. <laughs> he looks sad. Aye. What's wrong, McCabe? Aye, it's Agate again. I just had another set to with him. Oh? He's been after me ever since we left Boston. Aye, I'm afraid of him. What are you afraid of? I don't know. He might do anything. As long as the first mates are running this ship, we're headed straight for trouble. <laughs> And so it went. As we neared the horn, Mr. Agate seemed more and more in charge, the keeper of our destiny. And we scarcely ever saw the captain. But by that time, the spring storms of October broke upon us. And we were busy hauling, furling canvas to keep the ship upright on course through tempest gales and freezing, icy rain. Day after night after day, we plunged through mountainous waves, driven westward through the straits by savage, lashing gales. We were on deck, on watch continuously, furling sails, tying broken yards and spars, drenched by rain and snow and sleet and hail, and waves that tried to wash us over. Dana! Dana! Hi! Black off, Harris! Huh? 
against the head pump. Here's another. Steady on. Right. There he caught me. Been below deck? Stay out of it. Everything's awash. There ain't a bell all over. Look out. Another. Are we, are we shipping water? No. Pilgrim's built for worse than this. It's McKay. Easy on there. Careful, does it? Oh, what a night, eh? Rough night. Let me up that rigging, Harris. Where you going? Up the mainmast. Why are you deaf? Order. Royal yard. Get it away. But in this weather. You can't climb a rock, McKay. Have to order. Who's ordered? First mate. Mr. Haggard says I go along. So I go along. All right, I'll rattle through. Fool. He'll never make it. Not in this gale. Hold on. Watch it. <laughs> There he is. Still climbing aloft. Can't we, can't we do something? Not an honor, Dan, especially when it comes from Mr. Rack. How can he hold on in this wind? Not the heave of the ship. Oh, look out! He's slammed, he's falling. <laughs> the cave was lost. There was nothing we could do to save it. Four days later, when the Cape Storm blew itself away, Harris and I were talking. He ordered this cave up in the rigging. Mr. Raggett ordered him along. What do you mean, Harris? I think he tried to kill McCabe. I wonder. Harris and Dana were on deck that night. They saw it happen. The mate ordered McCabe aloft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, man! Would an officer in his right mind order a man aloft like that? He certainly would not. It's a mixed man, he is. I hate mad. Well, men, what are we going to do about Mr. Agar? Uh, we can't do a thing. Huh? What's that, Dana? There's nothing to be done, men. Well, can't we go to Captain Taylor? No, it wouldn't do any good. Why, what do you mean, Dana? We don't know a thing for certain. And Captain Taylor, sick or well, has faith in Mr. Agar. But if the mate is really mad... That's not for us to say. Why not? Why can't we take the law in our own hands? Yeah, that's, that's mutiny, men! And at sea, mutiny's never the answer to the troubles of a crew. You better think it over. With fresh, strong wind behind us, we sailed on, northward, up along the coast of South America, past Chile, Panama, Mexico, closer, drawing closer to our goal of California. And throughout the long five months of travel, we suffered neath the stinging lash of Mr. Agate's vicious tongue. From dawn to dusk, he screamed at us, threatened us, and swore at us. And when the good ship Pilgrim anchored at our destination, San Diego, and our voyage halfway through, the worst, we hoped, was over. And we celebrated with a shore leave. Our first since leaving Boston, as the crew was emptied of her cargo, and the holes refilled with cattle hide. And then, in April... We set sail again, bound for the Cape and home. The Pilgrim was going back to Boston, and we were going home. We thought the mate might change, but he was no different than before. He managed everything, and ranted, roared, and raved. He didn't have a friend aboard the ship. Coming off watch one afternoon... I brushed with Mr. Agate just after he'd left the captain's cabin. Oh, excuse me, sir. What are you doing here, Dana? Why, why nothing, sir. I'm going forward to my bunk. Well, get along in. Stay away from this cabin. I don't want none of you swapped even getting near Captain Taylor. Understand? Watch, Dana. Hi. Well, you look like somebody jarred your compass. I just fell foul of the mate. Oh, in today, huh? I'm glad you want to drift to Mr. Agate this time. Outside Captain Taylor's cabin. Oh, giving the old man medicine, I guess. How is the captain? Well, no one knows but the mate. The old man hasn't been out of his cabin since we left California. He's been in there alone nearly two months. Except for Mr. Agate. Aye. Except for Mr. Agate. Strict orders of the mate. Nobody goes inside. Cabin door's most always locked. Captain Taylor must be very sick. We have to take the mate's word, Dana. He knows more about medicine than anyone else aboard. Maybe he knows too much. You know, Harris, mm. I'm curious about that cabin. What do you mean? Do you suppose someone could get inside and find out about Captain Taylor? Talk to him alone? 
Why, I, I don't know. Donna. I mean, is the cabin door always locked? Well, most of the time, yes, but who dare to go inside against the mate's orders? I might. What? You? I'm curious about that cabin, Harris. I'd take the chance. But the mate, he'd kill you if he found you there. Aye, he would that. But it's worth a try. If you and the crew will help me. I have a plan. Of course we'll help you, Dana. We must get word to the captain. Tell him about the ship and the mate. It's our only chance. We must get word to the captain. Careful now. The mate, huh? Here he comes, careful. Uh, Mr. Agate. Well? Well, what do you swads want? We, uh, we're, uh, having trouble binding these spars. Huh? We can't lash them tight enough, mister. Let me have a look. There. Ah. Well, this rope's too wet, see? Uh, aye, aye. You two call yourselves sailors. Huh? You use some dry rope like this. Make a bite, circle around twice. Aye, you Captain Taylor? Yeah. Yeah. What do you want? I thought that door was locked. I, uh, I'm sorry to bother you, sir, but I have to talk to you. You see, I... That is, we of the crew didn't know how well you were, sir. And we wanted... Crew? You speak for the crew? Aye, sir. Mr. Agate tells me the crew is going to mutiny. You're dissatisfied with your work. Mutiny? That's what he says. Oh, no, Captain. Eh? We, uh, well, we're not exactly satisfied with Mr. Agate's way of running the ship in your absence. But we're all working, sir. Working hard. There'll be no mutiny. But, but he told me. The mate. It's not true, Captain Taylor. Believe me, sir, I speak for all the crew. Well, well why did the mate tell me that? Mutiny is a serious charge. Aye, sir, it is. Nothing strange about all this, lad. What he's been telling me. Why, I... I oh, uh, can, I, can I help you, sir? It's... It's just my complaint. Uh, uh, I'm the medicine, lad. Medicine? Tablet. Out the tablet. Oh. You see, Captain? Hey, right, lad. And some water. Why, what's wrong, lad? Sir. These tablets. Eh? Yeah? Did... Did Mr. Agate give you these? Aye, lad. And you've been taking them? The last two months. I'm a sick man, lad. Of course, sir, I understand. But if I may ask, sir, do you really feel better after taking these? Well, uh, no, not so much. Mr. Agate says if I don't take the tablets, I might feel worse. The mate told you that, sir. Aye. Captain... I have a suspicion that all isn't right. What's that, lad? These tablets. What you talking about? Captain Taylor, speaking for the crew, I'd like to tell you about the way the ship's been run since you've been locked in here. All right, lad. The mate wasn't wrong when he said we talked about mutiny. But we had a reason, sir. And that's what I want to tell you. We agreed that I should come and tell you about these things. We thought you'd want to know, Captain. It's incredible. Incredible, lad. I've wondered about the mate. And this explains a lot of things to me. But what can I do, lad? I'm too weak to leave this bed. What can I do? Well, if I may suggest, sir... Aye, lad. First of all, stop taking these tablets, sir. I don't know what they are, but I'd stake my life they're harmful. But if I stop, lad, uh, I may get worse. Well, possibly... I'll chance it. Crew and my ship mean more to me in life. I'll chance it. We need you, sir, to take control of the ship again. That'll be the day, lad. If the scheme works. It must work, Captain Taylor. You must come back and take command. We're five or six weeks off Cape Horn. And in the dead of winter, we can never sail around without you, sir. The captain followed our advice and slowly came around to health again. Lots of exercise. When he was hungry, we sneaked him bully beef and biscuit, all unknown to Mr. Agate, though. And then, one day in June, Captain Taylor left his cabin, came on deck, quite suddenly, surprising all the crew at work. But most of all, surprising Mr. Agate. Master, master, you swabs! 
What I need is a black snake whip. That makes you move along. Did you say something about a whip, Mr. Agger? Yes. Why, why, Captain. Uh, surprised to see me, eh, mate? You. You, sir. You shouldn't be up. Oh, no. Why not, Mr. Agger? Why, your health, sir. My health? I, I never felt better. Your uh, cure was real good, Mr. Agat. I feel fine. Oh, you do? Well, you got no right up here. No? Then why not? I've earned my right to run this ship. Oh? I've been running a pilgrim for the last three months and before that. So I understand. And I can sail her into Boston myself. Oh, can you now, Mr. Agat? And nobody will stop me. No? Well, I can stop you, Mr. Mate. You've been running things too long aboard my ship. You made several big mistakes. First, when you tried to poison me. Huh? And then when you didn't recognize men, real men, these men, your crew. The crew? But they were going There's not a better crew on any ocean, Mr. Agat. You might learn a lot by watching them. They're mutiny. What it about It seems to me, Mr. Mate, that if anybody is guilty of insurrection and taking over the control of a ship, it's you, Mr. Mate, and nobody else. Yes, sir. Yes, Captain. If I didn't need every man jack aboard ship to get around the horn, I'd toss you in the brig, Mr. Mate. So you're on good behavior. And if you make good, I'll forget about the charges I mean to bring against you, mate. Aye, sir. Watch your step, Mr. Raggett. And don't be asking any man jack to do a job you wouldn't do yourself. Oh, hey, no. Captain Taylor, there's a bow headed out of the south, sir. Aye, lad. First of the Cape Storms. You'll have them all the time from now on. Short turn sail! Man the Cloulin! Man the Cloulin! It's getting dark, sir, in the southeast. Aye. Aye, it'll be rough and heavy through the straits this time of year. Aye, sir. Mr. Raggett! Aye, sir. Aye, Captain. You think you can manage to help us out? Aye, sir. On your way, then, mate. But I advise you, watch your step. <laughs> We'd prepared for winter weather, but we never expected the heavy storms that lashed our ship from stem to stern as we went around the Cape. The worst of all the storms struck late one night when I'd come up on watch. The great ship rolled and pitched and wallowed in a heavy sea, driven blindly eastward by a gale of rain and sleet and snow. It was all a man could do to keep his feet upon the wet and slippery decks. Dana! Dana! Hi, sir! Hi, Captain Taylor! Easy on there, lads. Aye, sir. Harry's with you. Right here, Captain. Good. She's rough tonight, lads. Aye, she's heavy. You lash the longboat? Aye, aye, sir. Now, oh, hold on. Here comes the tall one. Aye. Lift the rigging holes. We'll weather through. Every spine yard on splash down, sir. That's right, Captain. Well, we'll hope for the best, lads. Uh, have you seen the mate, Mr. Aggers? It's along the deck, Captain. Oh. Belay, mate! Mr. Aggers! Light along, Mr. Aggers! Hi, Captain. You want it, please? Hi, Mr. Aggers. All snug-aft. Hi, Captain. Took another turn of lashing around. <coughs> she's not fast down, sir! Hi! She's down all right. Dragon loose. Yeah, she's liable to break off, saving the deck. Somebody ought to go aloft. See? Lash her down against the mast. But it's dangerous. A man can't climb up in this wind. Let's see. But she's got to be lashed. Can't be done, Captain. Not in this weather. No worse than night. You sent the cable off. What did you say, Harry? You heard him, Mr. Raggett. You sent the cape up in weather as bad as this. Well, oh, you can order a lot this time, Mr. Raggett. Well, I... Uh, that top mare's got to be mended, mate. You going aloft yourself? Me? No. No, I won't. No. It's death for the man that tries... But you ordered the cable off, didn't you? I won't. It's death. Certain death. All right, Mr. Raggett. You've had your chance to make good, and you failed. I don't care. I won't go up. I won't. I won't. No. No! Captain Taylor! Hey, Dana. I'll go a lot, sir. Yes. I'll go up. You? She must be lashed down, sir. I think I can do the Hush. job. It's a long chance, Dana. I know, Harris. But I'll try it by May, Captain. Well, I'm not ordering you, Dana. But if you think you can make it... Aye, sir. Then go aloft, Dana. And best of luck. Thank you, sir. The wind's bitter. The rope's icy. Be careful, lads. Watch your step, Dana. I'll be careful. We can make a play. Hey. I don't know, Harris. Mr. Agat! Aye, sir. Keep your eye on young Dana, doing the job you're afraid to do. Climbing higher. Higher. Up and up I climb, hand over hand upon the icy ropes and rigging. Sleet and rain beat down and splashed my face. The whole ship lurched suddenly. It escaped me into the sea. 
seemed like hours until my frosty, bleeding hands had lashed the throat like a man. I started down to death. Here he is, sir. Here's Taylor. Oh, easy, lad, easy. Hi, Captain. Hey, give me a hand, then. I'll help you. I. You lash her down tight, lad. Hi, Captain. As good as McKay might have done himself. Watch it, another one. <laughs> You're a brave lad, Tina, a brave lad. Agus! Mr. Agus! Hey, sir. Hi, Captain. You call yourself a mate? Take a look at a real seaman. <laughs> Members of my crew, that I know what you went through under the rule of Mr. Agate. And he'll stand trial for his misdeeds when we get to Boston. <laughs> Since Mr. Agate's in the brig, that leaves us without a first mate. And since young Dana had the most to do with bringing Mr. Agate to justice, I'd like for Richard Dana to be first mate of the Pilgrim till we get to Boston. Well, congratulations, Mr. Dana. I... I don't know what to say, Harris. You should have been the one to get the first mate's birth. Well, you earned it, Dana. I didn't. <laughs> I uh, guess your good luck white elephant wasn't working this time. Oh, huh? uh, one thing more, man. Mr. Agate won't be drawing his salary down in the bridge. So I propose to divide it up equally among the crew. I expect you can use the extra money when we get to Boston. <laughs> When we get to Boston. Ah, those were magic words to us who had been away from home so long. And the last weeks and days went quickly. After two long years at sea. Two years at sea. Well, Mr. Dana. <laughs> All right, Harris. Now that we're sailing into Boston Harbor, you can drop the formality. Oh? Huh? Why? Well, in a few hours, I won't be first mate. And the pilgrim and our long voyage will just be a memory. Well, in that case, Dana, here's a good luck piece I'd like to give you. You know, the tiny elephant you always liked? Oh, yes, but here, Dana. Little souvenir. Oh, thank you. Little souvenir of our trip together. Two years before the match. <laughs> This story of two years before the mass, suggested by Richard Henry Dana's classic of that name, was written by Tom Goutte and was the first in NBC's new series, Adventure Ahead. Young Dana was played by John Thomas. Music was by Doc Whiffle. The entire production was directed by Joseph Mansfield. During the weeks to come, as each Saturday morning unfolds Adventure Ahead, you will meet a gallery of heroes and heroines who appeal to youthful-minded listeners of every age. From the pages of books and stories, both old and new, your adventures will come to life, engaging in their exploits solely for your pleasure. NBC and its affiliated independent stations present Adventure Ahead as a public service. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>